All right. Good morning. So 9 a.m. and a lot of people are already awake. That's good. Cool. Um, so just show of hands, uh, who is not using C++ 11 or at least knows about C++ 11 already? Okay. <laughs> you know about C++ 11. All right. Cool. So pretty much everybody knows at least C++ 11. Uh, that's good because otherwise you would have a hard time, I guess. Um, cool. So my name is Roland Bock. I'm a principal software engineer at Pipro Financial Limited. I'm also the author of uh, this library here, C++, uh, SQL++ 11. And um, this library is going to be the, the vehicle of this talk. Um, the, the use case examples of um, C++ 17 are based on this library. Right. Um, in order to get you acquainted with the library, I'll give you a short bit of history. Um, so when I started to, to write C++, that was about 2008, um, the first thing that I had to do basically was uh, interacting with databases. And at that time that, mean, that meant um, writing strings and sending those strings to the database. Um, and it could look like this, I mean, maybe, hopefully not exactly like this. Um, when I prepared the slides, I deliberately added three errors in here. Okay, anybody sees more than three, just out of curiosity? Yes. Yes. Not more than three, all right, okay. There are, I think there are five in there, I'm not sure. So um, when I gave a test presentation of this talk, uh, I was pointed out to another one when I, uh, Went through the slides yesterday evening. I saw another one, I think. So, um, just about the point why, why this is bad to have such a string-based library. So, yeah, the, there's a space missing after the name. There should be quotes. Uh, you shouldn't use equal equal because that's C++ syntax. That's not SQL. Um, you should probably escape the whole thing, but the name thingy. Probably, because otherwise you might have uh, SQL injection. And there is a typo. Uh, priority is not spelled that way. Um, so it's just a stupid collection of stuff that, uh, that happens when you write um, SQL and C++ on a string-based library. At least it happens to me all the time because I really cannot concentrate on, on this kind of nonsense. Right? I want the compiler to take care of this. So um, then in 2010, um, I had a first uh, RFC for, for the boost mailing list. I said, well, um, that was still C++ 98, and I, th I said, well, I, I have this idea of an SQL library. Right? Uh, what do you think of that? And the boost community, well, they replied with, yes, there is interest, but also with, well, you shouldn't use vector, damn it. You should use ranges. You should use proto for your, uh, for your DSL, because proto, that is the thing. Uh, that was the thing at the time, definitely. Um, Dave Abraham said, I don't like SQL. I, I cannot program in SQL. Um, write, a, write an algebra library and then uh, make, it be, make it such that you can transform it to SQL. Right? And others said, well, no, 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 no. That's not the way to do it. Um, I don't want to learn a new language. I'm pretty comfortable with SQL, so keep it this way. Okay, so something was wrong, obviously. Um, and it took me a bit of time, uh, and uh, when C++11 came out, I worked on a new thing, and then three years later, uh, presented uh, what I call SQL++11. And this has now a, um, a nice interface, I'd say. So you can write code in C++ <coughs> that pretty much looks like SQL, so anybody who knows SQL can read this. So here we select two columns from a table, foo, um, with some condition, and then the result rows have members that have appropriate names and appropriate types, and everything is cool. Right? And this time the, the discussion was completely different. Uh, this time it was, all right, um, well, you could still use uh, Metapass because Metapass was then the thing of the day. Um, and you should be uh, parsing strings and turn those into your expressions. Um, all right, not in my life, but okay. Um, and otherwise it was, well, what do you do with prepare statements? How do you handle, um, I don't know, binary transfer, multi-row inserts? Um, 
and uh, the people asking um, how can I write it connected to my uh, database? So somebody wanted to use Postgres, and I only had connectors to other libraries, uh, other databases. So discussion was completely different, um, and seems like I hit um, hit a nerve there. So um, in the in the following years, I gave a bunch of talks um, about about the library, and um, for instance. Um, a talk about how to reduce the amount of error messages that you get from such a library because it's heavily templated and you as a user um, of user uh, if you if you are a user of heavy templated libraries then in many cases you get these horrible error messages um, and I try to cut those down so that was one talk and then last year I gave um, a talk um, pretty ad hoc about uh, variants of veridic and so the task is, if you have a bunch of bools at compile time and you want to figure out if all of them are true, how do you, how do, you do that? And the, there are two answers to that. One is for C++11, that is you write a, a small helper that takes a bunch of bools, and then uh, you instantiate this helper in the first time with bool and all these arguments, and the second time with all the arguments and bool uh, at the end. And if if and only if all the arguments are true, then these two helpers are the same, okay? And then still the same returns you the result, okay? That is, as far as I know, still the fastest way to do it. Um, but there is a much more elegant way to do it, right? And that is with C++ 17. So um, there you have fold expressions, and then you can just say, well, I. I use true as, a, as an initial value and then combine it with end uh, with every single of the arguments, right? And if, it, if the expression is still true, then every argument is true. Okay. Um, if you compare that, well, I'm always going for readability here, uh, even if it's slower to compile. Cool, and that's, um, this talk basically spawned the idea, okay, I want to migrate um, SQL++11 to C++17. And a bunch of the things that I learned about uh, on my way um, are presented now in this talk. Right. So, first topic, so we'll, we'll start off with a bunch of language topics and then afterwards with a few, um, with a few library topics. First is inline variables and um, non, auto non-type template parameters. So, um, in SQL++11, um, we have to deal with names somehow. Um, I showed you the example and um, also for the generated code for the SQL. Um, you have to deal with names a bit. So um, there is a necessity to, to have the SQL name of a column somewhere, for instance, or of a table. Um, these are currently encoded in, in these static const expert character literals. And there's a problem with those, because you cannot use them at runtime. That is very annoying. Right? So they don't count as, uh, as initialized for the linker. You can use them at compile time for crazy stuff, but you cannot use them at runtime. So I had to work around that. Also, I wanted to have... Um, something that I can use um, to make sure that all these <coughs> names are, um, are unique. We we'll come to that. Um, and um, the idea was to wrap these into, um, into something like this, a character sequence that just takes a bunch of characters um, as template arguments. And then, well, if you wanna have the, the string representation, well, you can just um, ask for a character point that, can, that contains these characters. Seems stupid, but in C++11 you had to do it this way. Um, now, how do you how do you construct that? As I said, you can use the character sequence at compile time. So what you can do is you can pass this character sequence um, as a reference to a template. Uh, you also have to pass the length because otherwise the the template wouldn't know what to do with it. Um, and then you can from there build um, a character sequence. Okay. So using the index sequence, and then you can specialize on, on that and just iterate through all of those and um, put that into the, um, into the character sequence type. 
Okay. Um, by the way, if you if you have questions, um, feel free to ask them, um, or otherwise just wait and, and go to the microphone later. Yes. You can wrap the character arrays into a function, a static function, and uh, get rid of the problem of the yeah. Also, the comment is I could have um, made the uh, instead of using a, a, a member directly, I could have um, um, a static function of this type that returns this. Um, then again, I, I still need to to create this this type for for other purposes. Okay, um, and it's it's more code, and these um, these things are exposed to the user. Um, so I don't want to have an additional function in there. Uh, I want to have it as short as possible. So cool. Um, so in the end, I, and I had something like this. So this character literal, and then um, a using for this type. Now in C plus plus seventeen, the situation has changed because, well. At least this compiles. So, um, if you um, if you want to um, do, do just that, to have a have a string that you can define at compile time and use at runtime, that's cool. Um, this works now because um, we have inline variables, and these are defined in place just like that. Uh, so it does what you expect to do. And there's no surprise at link time. Um, and static const expert variables are by definition always inline. Okay, so that is neat. Um, reduces the, the boilerplate for this um, for this character sequence class a bit. And what we also can do is we can now pass variables or um, references or whatever, um, so any non-type template parameters to the template without specifying the type. Um, this is neat in, in the sense that I don't have to pass the length anymore to this to this template. So the this make character sequence now just gets the characters uh, character array and um, well we'll do something with it. Behind the scenes, it does just still the same thing. So um, you have a character sequence impl that is specialized then for um, for a character array array of a given given length. Um, don't get around that, but then, well, after that, the, the same machinery continues to work. Um, but if you compare the, um, the this code, in, in the first case, you had to um, pass the length. So this is duplication. It feels stupid that you have to pass the size of the literal and the literal itself. Um, in C++ 17, you get rid of that. Right? That's gone. It's easier to read. Good. Um, another. Interesting side effect of C++ 17 being simpler is that, well, if you don't have to fight to get this to work at all, you can concentrate more um, on the beauty of the thing. Right? Um, so I had more time on my hands to think about it. And well, things that should, should have been obvious probably in the first place, but I just didn't have the time to think about them, was I can um, make this um, uh, character sequence generation an external function basically so in, in template metaprogramming terms an external function it's a free function of the of the struct I don't have to have that inside of the struct there's no value of having the uh, the character sequence type inside of the struct okay um, so in the end I just have that okay. I find this way more beautiful than what I had before And that's thanks to C++ 17. Right. So yeah, nicer code, I think. Uh, it's less code. Um, it's improved compile times because I have, in the end, less types. Because um, before those, they were embedded types sometimes, or tab aliases, at least. Um, all right. Moving on to, to the next thing. Any questions, by the way, for, for this here? OK. Cool. So <clears throat> the next part is um, about um, notice card, if cons expert, and class template deduction. Um, and let's start with a 
with a motivating example for this. So in SQL++11, most of the things that you can do wrong are, uh, are known to the compiler, and the compiler will tell you about it. So whenever you, um, you forget some, some column, uh, sorry, sorry uh, a table in the front um, where you have, a, um, we have columns selected, um, the compiler will tell you. If you're comparing apples and orange, oranges, the compiler will tell you. If, if you have columns with identical names, the compiler will tell you. But still, you can do a, a few things uh, incorrectly. Like here, you um, select all the columns from T uh, with some condition, and then store that into some variable. And then later on, after some other code maybe, uh, you say, oh, right, I want to order them. Right? And you say S order by something. Now, this looks reasonable, but it does basically nothing. Um, the thing is that um, when you call order by, that is a const member function of the select, it just returns a new statement, a new statement that then contains the order by. So calling this, um, well, while it does something and returns something, but in the end, it will everything be erased and result in nothing. And especially S will not be changed. So your SQL results will probably be unexpected. Right. So, yes, Jason. Well, I, I may be jumping ahead, but I'm curious if you just found in general, well, okay, no, go to the next slide, then I'll ask my question. Okay. I am jumping ahead. <laughs> I'll ask a question. All right, all right, cool. Um, I think you will have to wait for a couple of more, more slides, okay, but... <laughs> All right, cool. So um, before, um, before we look at everything that has changed, uh, let's first see how it's currently implemented in, in C++11. So you have this order by function. It's a, it's a member function of, um, of a clause, which is then the base clause of a, um, of a statement. Um, the member function takes a bunch of expressions, right? And then uh, it has a return type that depends on, on this check order by thingy that basically returns whether the expressions are reasonable for order by or not. And um, this new statement thingy is, is, um, is a local type alias and it will do some, some stuff depending on this uh, condition and we'll use this order by to, uh, with the expressions um, to construct a <laughs> new statement basically. Okay? Um, the details of that um, are not really important right now. Um, and then it will do um, tag dispatch inside of this function to the implementation of order by. Yes? Just to say, is the idea here that if order by is not valid, this will sphene away the um, No, it will not sphene away. Um, <laughs> you'll see just in a second in the overloads um, that something else is happening. So, um, the, the order by impl will then be called uh, with a with tag dispatch. So depending on uh, what check order by, uh, what kind of type that is. Um, there is a good case. Um, in that case, uh, check order by will be of consistent type. Um, that will just create a new statement with the new order by and everything is fine. Um, and then in the bad case, so everything else, everything that is not um, not consistent. We'll return a special error indicating type. Um, if you've seen one of my previous type, uh, previous talks, um, this thing will internally contain a static assert, um, which will fire under normal circumstances. But if you um, if you want to test it, you can test that whether the user will actually get the the static assert that it, that the user should get. All right. Um, all right. So. Is that nice? Is that easy to read? I don't know. I, I really don't like it, to be honest. Um, it works just fine, but um, there should be better ways. And if, you, if we go to C++17, well, we can get rid of all the, of all the horrible uh, tag dispatch. So, in C++17, we have, of course, all the features of uh, C++14 as well. In particular, we have uh, return type deduction, 
But we also have this new feature like that is called if cons expert. And now we use basically the same check as before, uh, which you can evaluate to true or false. And you put that into the if cons expert. And then in the good case, well, we basically do the same as before. Uh, we return uh, a new statement. And in the bad case, we return something else. Right? That looks funny, but it works. Why does it work? Well, because um, if const expert means that the one of these blocks, one of the blocks in the if statement, so either the good case or the bad case, will be actually compiled. And the other one is pretty much ignored. It has to be syntactically correct. Uh, the compiler will check that for you, so you cannot write complete garbage in there. But otherwise, the compiler will ignore it. Right. So for return type deduction, either of the branches is gone away, which is why we can seemingly return two different return types from this function. Right. So that, I think, is pretty neat. So we get, get rid of the complete nonsense of type dispatch. It's much more readable. And if you compare that to the previous slide, by the way, this does not contain the implementations of the functions. Right? This is just the, the boilerplate. Right? And it's much more characters. If you go here, way more white space, and it, can, it, and it includes, actually, the implementation of the functions. Right? I mean, they're not very long, admittedly, but still. Right? So this is, this is wonderful. This is life-changing for anyone who's using Tag Dispatch these days. Yo. Why do you um, Because it's cons, and I have um, specializations for those which are uh, specialized on non-cons. Oh, sorry, sorry, the question was, uh, why do I decay the, um, the, the check type? <coughs> yes, Ben. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. So with C17, uh, you can move the uh, initialization of the check uh, into the if, if you want that. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's, um, it's even shorter now. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't pollute the outer scope, right? So, well. That is also cool. Um, all right, moving on. Um, then we have these things here, that these um, proxy functions, make tuple. Um, now, make tuple does some some additional magic that you may want to rely on. So uh, what I'm saying now is not for every use case. So for instance, um, make tuple also, uh, I think. Um, resolves um, standard reference. Um, but what you also can do is, um, instead of writing this, what you would have done in C++11, uh, you can now use um, the, the constructor guys for, uh, for class template deduction and just write this. Because what what did work in the past with normal functions, the compiler can deduce the, the argument types that you pass it. Um, that didn't work in the past, so up, up until 2014, uh, C++ 14, sorry. Um, this didn't work, but with C++ 17, this works just, just fine. So the compiler can, um, for many of the standard types, can already um, deduce that um, and, uh, and figure out the, the template parameters for tuple itself. And um, we can do the same for our own things. And then the whole questions of whether I want to de decay this or not uh, will go away. Um, because I can use uh, template, um, sorry, uh, class template deduction uh, for this as well. In some cases, I have to help the compiler. In most of the, or in many cases, the compiler will just be able to deduce it by the, by the constructors that some class has. 
But in the case of um, that statement, the last one um, I mentioned before, I have some specialization for those, and the, the primary template um, is not even defined, or was not even defined until um, C++ 17. Um, so if the primary, statement, uh, primary template doesn't have any constructor, then the compiler won't be able to deduce anything, regardless of what kind of specialization um, you have and what kind of constructors those have. That, that doesn't matter. Uh, you have to have compiler guides in the primary template or associated with the primary template. So um, in this case, well, that statement in, as the primary template is something that contains a static assert that will um, this this wrong thing will evaluate to wrong as to false. Sorry, um, and so whenever you try to um, to specialize this or to use this, um, this will fire a static assert and tell you to use some some other specialization. Um, but there is a um, a constructor added to this nonetheless, right? and this helps the compiler to figure out which bad statement to use. Okay, because it takes an argument of the, uh, of the template parameter type. Cool, so now we have this, um, and I hope that we're not coming to Jason's question, right, um, or Jason's remark, uh, that, uh, what to do with the return types. Is um, we haven't done anything yet. So far, we haven't. Uh, we have just cleaned it up, made it easier to read. So uh, while all that is cool, uh, we still have the same problem that uh, we could return this, and the user would not be any wiser. Um, but there is a new keyword, or a new uh, sorry, a new attribute for um, for functions. You can say no discard, and that's an indicator that you don't want anybody to um, accidentally discard the return value of this function, right? And um, then if you call this in the same way as we did before, then there's almost certainly a compiler warning. Almost certainly because the standard doesn't mandate that. I, I don't know why. Um, it highly, highly recommends it. I, um, I, I don't know the exact wording for that, but it basically says, Implementers are recommended to issue a warning here, but it's not mandatory. Yes, Jason. Uh, I, I don't believe there are any mandated warnings in the standard, so that might be why they decided to not add it there. But I was wondering if you found, in general, that adding no discard on all return values of const number functions was like a best practice to do across your code base. Okay, so the, the question is whether adding no discard to all const member functions that return something is a good idea? Yeah. Um, yes, I think so. Okay. Yeah. It sounds like a good idea. I haven't considered it until you just put this up. Okay. Well, <laughs> cool. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm using it all over the place. So uh, wherever I return something from a const function, I do that because everything else would probably be a bad usage. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. What is it? <laughs> anyway, so yeah. All right. Okay. Um, I think we should. Thank you. Stop the the tool discussion here before it before it derails. All right. Thanks. Um, okay. So yeah. As. I think everybody's seen so, uh, this re uh, results in much nicer code, much less code, um, cleaner code because well you don't have this all this um, additional rubbish that you have to care about with template parameters and um, and decay and whatnot. Um, there is improved compile time because well you don't have um, all these uh, additional template instantiations um, and less bugs. Right. Users have less bugs with these. Cool. So uh, moving on, fold expressions. Um, I've shown this example in the beginning. Um, this, this thing for um, figuring out whether all the bools are true, that is so simple to write now that it doesn't even make sense to have an alias for that. You can just use it wherever you want. Right? That is, that's just really nice. OK. Um, Good. Um, one use of fold expressions that I have in the library is um, print tuple members as comma-separated list. Okay. 
And um, for this, I have a small helper that um, basically does does nothing but add a comma to to a stream and then return the value. So um, yeah, you instantiate it with with a stream, a separator, and then it will figure out whether it's the first time that it's called, um, and then it will set its first false, and otherwise it will just print the separator to the stream and return the expression that you handed it in. Um, and that can be used like this in this code here. Um, so I uh, instantiate um, a separator with O stream in this case and a comma as, as a separator. And then I can use that in the full expression, right? So on the left end, I start with, uh, with O stream and then just left shift or stream every, every of these expressions um, into the stream. Um, and before you get too wrinkled up, <laughs> sorry, um, this this only this only works in in my code because I know for sure that um, when this function is called with this tuple with these columns here, I know for sure that they're all different types. Because otherwise, uh, you would be in deep trouble with this code. I mean, otherwise, you would have to uh, go by index. Right. But that would add a, another level of indirection, and for for the um, for the in, um, for the for the index list, um, this is nice. Right. Okay. Everything everything good? You have a question? Okay. Cool. Um, another thing that I uh, already mentioned that I have is typesets. Um, so I. I want to compare types and figure out whether, for instance, all of them are unique. Um, so as a typesets are a neat way to do it. And typesets become much more easy uh, in, in C++ 17. So in order to write a typeset, um, well, we start with, a, with a, something that can be used as a base class. Um, and then, well, we create some typeset struct. It takes a bunch of, um, bunch of types which are hopefully unique. And internally, it has this struct impl that is then inheriting from all these different base classes. Right? Um, this will crash the compiler if you pass in anything that is not unique, by the way. Well, it crashes some compilers, I'd say. Um, and then, um, before we go into how to construct this, um, we'll start with, um, with checks. Right? Um, how to check whether there's an element in this set. Well, you can just check whether um, whether base t um, is a base class of this impl class, right? And the compiler will just tell you, yeah, well, yes, it is or it isn't, um, depending on whether um, t is one of these elements. Okay, so that's fine. And um, then you can start with fold expressions, uh, for instance, to figure out if something is a superset of something else. Right? And in this case, if it's a superset, then um, from the, for the right-hand side, uh, all these, these t's have to be um, elements of ourselves, which is what we test here. So we start with true, uh, and then combine it with and count for first t, second t, and so on. That's what full expression does, right? Goes through all the all the arguments <coughs> one by one and applies this operator to the left. Right? Um, there are different versions of uh, how full expressions can work, whether um, whether left or right, or uh, you can have different um, different uh, ways to initialize them. But I like this best for most cases. Okay, so that is neat. Um, and then we're coming closer now to actually constructing something. Um, so we, if we want to insert a new type into, into this typeset, then well, we have a, a function. And well, no discard because it's a const function. Um, it, takes, it takes a template parameter t. And then we can just check, well, if the, if the count is false, um, then we already have it. Uh, sorry, if the if the count is true, then we already have it. Then we just return uh, an instance of this typeset, and otherwise we add the t to the list of elements that we already have, and return that. Okay, so we're done. 
And then to make this useful for fold expressions, we just add an operator that does exactly the same. Right? So um, this one has to take a value, and since we don't know how, in all cases how to construct a value, this um, uses the base class that, or the, the space helper type. Um, then, uh, then it just calls insert and returns that. Okay. And now, if we want to construct a type set, we just take any number of t's. Right? They don't have to be unique. We just take any number of t's and then initialize the fold expression with an empty type set. And just shift every of our types in there. Right? It will make sure that everything is unique. Okay. And then we have a type set. And then we can use it like this. Um, that's for the for the columns. So when you when you select columns, um, like we then used in, the, in this print example, um, this will check whether the character sequence types of all these columns, so it's extracting the, the names from these columns and repre represents them as types, whether all of these are um, puts all of these in a typeset and then com uh, compares the size of this typeset with the number of columns. And if that happens to be the same, then everything is unique. So um, that's the good case. Good. So, um, yeah, full expressions lead to um, more expressive code, lead to less code, lead to improved compile times. Um, so I, I haven't done extensive tests with this, but for instance, I, uh, I created a um, I use this um, create typeset function with what I have in SQL++11 and what I now have in, in the 17 version uh, with just a thousand ints. And well, it's the, the simplest test that I could have come up with in a short time. Um, the, the speed improvement is factor four. So that is not just a few percent. Um, also, since this is so much easier to implement, so much um, less trouble to do, um, well, it's not, you don't feel like you have to use it all the time because it was so hard to produce, right? So that's why I say less uh, reduced golden hammer syndrome. You don't, you don't use this thing all the time just because you have it. Um, that also leads to better compile times because sets are still expensive. Cool, so um, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to present about, um, about core features. Um, we now use um, some library features. We'll see. Okay, enough time. So string view. Um, just a just a few words about string view. Um, currently, when you have a text result field in in SQL plus 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 eleven, um, you typically have some some character pointer that you're provided, um, or the, 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 yeah, the content of it, which is provided by the backend of the database. Um, and a length, and then when you um, when you get the results or get a new result row, you bind um, this thing to to some kind of target, and um, that will reassign the the text pointer and and the length, and then uh, you assign these values to a string, right? because well in earlier versions we didn't have a string a string view, so um, if the length is always the same, that's not that bad because, well, you basically have to do a bit, bit of mem copy with the assign. Um, but if the length, but if the size increases, for instance, uh, from row to row, um, then you will have uh, reallocations in addition. So I don't know, that's annoying. Um, with C++ 17, we now have string view. String view is um, a non-only view on on a character pointer, for instance, and it doesn't allocate anything. It just happens to take a character pointer and a length. That's exactly what we have. Uh, we can put this in the string view, and it will then have a representation that almost looks like a string but isn't. Right? It has pretty much the same interface as a string, can be converted to a string. Uh, so if the user wants to do something that it, uh, like storing it in a, into a string, that's fine. Um, there is no, no difference in, in usage. Um, but internally, at least, um, the, the the memory usage and everything is is much nicer for this. Okay, so cool feature. Um, yeah, basically improved runtime performance. Okay, 
Um, <coughs> the next two things are um, std variant and std optional. And in order to, to see what, what I want to do, uh, let's go with this. So um, all the examples that, that I've shown before were um, examples where the, where the structure of the query is completely known at compile time. So every column is known, every, every table is known, everything. Right? But there are situations where, um, I don't know, you, you select some data from, from a database and sometimes you want to, to um, add a new column or a different column because um, this column is expensive and you don't want to extract it every time, but based on some condition you want to extract it. Right? So, um, that's where this uh, dynamic select comes from, uh, comes into play. Um, you can say, okay, dynamic select, and then you have dynamic columns and dynamic from. Um, you start with whatever is the, the default, and then I don't know if, if there is some condition, um, then you'll say, all right, I'll, I'll add another column, and <coughs> under some other condition, I'll add another column from, from a, even a different table than I used before. In that case, I also add a dynamic join. So, I mean, that, that's just wording in the library. Basically, you, you add a join um, to, to the from this way, um, and then the library will take care of that for you. Um, but since this is done at runtime, you cannot have the, the same uh, cool return rows or, or result rows uh, that we had before. So. The ID, which is uh, statically added to the query, that is still accessible as a member of the struct. The others, well, they have to be um, taken now um, in a map-like map -like fashion in this case. Um, so uh, we'll add a string here into, into this operator and then hopefully get something out. The type is also not clear. Um, the, the library currently only returns strings and then you have to do whatever you want to do with it. So I really don't like that. Um, but, oops. Um, then I, I thought about, well, first of all, variant, um, what to do with it. Um, and I thought, well, var variant could improve the situation quite a bit. Because instead of, um, instead of returning strings all the time, I could return a variant. And there are not too many types that that this library would return normally. There's, I don't know, there's bool, and there's some uh, integral types, there's a text type, there's a block, um, date, date time, okay, that's, I don't know, half a dozen or so. And we could return a, a variant on all of those, and then the, the user could figure out at runtime with some checks what kind of type this is, whether this actually matches, matches the expectations. Um, so that would be an option, but we would still do name lookup like this. Um, I don't know. Not a big fan of those, and um, and also this uh, checking at at runtime whether the type is really what I expect. Yeah, okay, not so good. And then I thought, well, if I um, if I look at use cases, um, not just a the general one like where where somebody maybe wants to add a a thousand additional columns under certain circumstances. Um, the usual use case is that you have some columns that are expensive. I don't know, maybe one, maybe three, I don't know, but a very limited number. Um, so what I could do is I could say, well, I make these, I indicate these columns as optional, right? Which is really what I want to express. And the user can say, well, the, this column is optional, and only only if um, if this optional has a value, then that tells the, the library that it should actually retrieve this value. Okay, and then it would look like this. So, same code as before, um, under some condition, we say, all right, we, we pass um, an optional of foo name, so of this column into the library, uh, sorry, into, into the select call, uh, and otherwise, if the condition is false, then we just pass uh, std nullout, which happens to be uh, a, an, an argument for the std optional constructor of, of any type, and we'll just con uh, construct an empty optional. So this way, the, the user can indicate whether or not 
they want to have this column selected and return, right? And um, in, the, in the second case where we actually have um, a different table in addition, then well, we can also join and say, well, this, this table um, that I join in here, that's, that's optional. And uh, the whole join expression will only be uh, created for the SQL if this optional is not empty. So this is, I think, a, a reasonable use of, uh, of optional, um, much better than the variant uh, version that I had thought of before. Um, and as you can see, well, the, the good news now is I now have members in my result struct that have the appropriate names. The only thing I have to do in, in the result is check uh, the condition and then I'm, I'm pretty sure that this will have the, uh, well, not pretty sure, that there is pretty much a guarantee that, um, that this thing will have some value. Unless the column itself is null, then this might still be an empty optional. Okay, but all this, all this crazy lookup by string, um, that's gone. All the um, insecurity, what the type might be, that's gone. Um, so we're back in type safety land. Cool, so even though I didn't use variant in the end, uh, it gave me new ideas of how to do it. Um, basically led me to, to the idea of using optional. Um, so yeah, thinking about um, C++ 17 features um, may be helpful even if you end up not using them. Um, that's a nice thing about this. And um, that brings me to the summary of, uh, of what we've seen here. Um, so a bunch of, um, of our <laughs> core features of the language, right? Um, yeah, they're, at least for, for, my, for my use, they're just wonderful, awesome, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's, it's super. And if somebody says that C++17 was a minor release, well, I don't know, not for me. For me, it's a great release. C++17 is just great for, for these users. Um, even though I'm variant, I don't use it yet, but um, other people will certainly have users for that. Cool. Um, and as mentioned, um, thinking about these things and experimenting with that also improves my C++11 code, right? Just by not having to think about stuff that hard anymore and coming to more elegant solutions, some of them suddenly, you realize, can be translated back to C++11. Right? And then code is easier. So for instance, my, my typeset, in, um, I haven't replaced it yet, but um, the typeset that I showed in, in C++17, it's not that hard to come up with something that is pretty close in C++11. It's not that bad, right? And, but I never had the ideas to do it uh, until I experimented with, with C++17. So even if you cannot use it in your professional life or in your, in your library currently, just play with it. It's cool, right? And it helps you. All right. That's it. Thank you. Right, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah, go ahead. So you showed iteration over the return of your select with a range four. Yes. Did you use structure bindings to unpack the, the struct that you got back? Um, so the question is, can I use structured bindings to uh, to deconstruct the, 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 the result row? I guess so, yes. If, if not, then I'll, I'll try to make it happen for sure. Yeah. I think the practical problem would be knowing what order to put in the result struct so that you could actually decompose them in a meaningful way. Yeah. I'm guessing you don't have any guarantee as to what order the elements are in the return structure. Uh, okay, so the, the remark is I, that 
I might not have a guarantee of the order of the elements. Um, actually, I do. The order of the columns. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the, the columns are ordered in, in the way, um, uh, so in, in, in the inside way. of the struct, they are ordered in the same way as you selected them in the oh. function. Yeah, so there is a guarantee for the order, but then again, well, uh, if you have several columns of the same type, um, structured binding might not exactly be what you want because then you don't have the name safety anymore. I really like the name safety of the, of the data members. Uh, where can we find the slide? slides? Um, the slides will be on, on GitHub sometime soon. Right. Uh, so. I guess all speaker slides will be uploaded to GitHub uh, and will be announced. Uh, right. More questions? All right, then thanks again.